Well, g'day and welcome to the channel. In today's video, I'm reviewing the brand new Nikon 180 to 600 from the perspective of a wildlife photographer, because that's what I am. I've had this for about a week. Nikon Australia sent it to me and I've taken over 10,000 photos in a heap of different environments and I'll be sharing loads and loads of photos with you. I'm also going to answer those common questions. How sharp is it at 600? How does it compare to the Sony 200 to 600? Is it worth the money that they're asking for it? Overall, this is going to be a very detailed review. There's chapters at the bottom of this video or in the description to help you if you want to jump ahead to a specific part, but I'm really excited to share this lens with you and what I was able to capture. So let's talk about the actual lens itself. It's a 180 to 600 millimeter zoom lens, and that focal range is extremely popular for wildlife. It's an internally focusing lens, so there's no extendable barrel. We simply go from 600 to 180 with the twist of the zoom ring. It's a very, very quick throw, feels fantastic. And that range is just great because it allows us to capture big mammals, small mammals, small birds. It's a very versatile zoom range. So this lens does fit into Nikon's affordable lens range. It's not one of their top of the range S-line lenses. And that's probably a good thing for the majority of people because it keeps the price down. It makes this extremely good value for money. How much is it? Well, in the US, it retails for around 1700 US. And in Australia, it's a little bit more expensive. It's close to the 3000 Australian dollar mark. But when we compare that to other 600 millimeter zoom lenses, it's extremely competitive. Now, if we compare it to the Sony, which is the most common comparison that I've been asked to make, this Sony re retails for around 2000 in the US. So this is 300 cheaper. But of note, these camera manufacturers have different pricing in different markets. And here in Australia, the cheapest I can find this on pre-order is around 2,900. However, I can pick up the Sony for around 2,400 at the moment. So even though the Sony's more expensive in the US, it's actually cheaper in a lot of overseas markets. Just something to consider. So even though this might be an affordable lens, it doesn't feel cheap in any way. And that's great. It feels extremely good quality. It sits in the hand. It's very tactile. It feels fantastic. It's of a very high quality, as you would expect, being a Nikon lens. It has weather sealing, as I mentioned, with lots of different gaskets inside. It's using really good glass. Overall, for what you get, I think it's an extremely good lens. Now, in terms of the switches, there's actually not all that many. It's got two switches on the side. One we have for obviously manual focus and autofocus, and then we have our focus limiter, which is either full or from infinity to six meters. The thing you'll notice that's missing from a lot of other lenses is there's no dedicated VR or image stabilization switch. It's actually done in the body itself. So you can change the VR there if you need to. If we move along, we now have this tripod collar. And a good thing is this tripod collar is removable. So we can take this tripod collar off, whereas on the Sony, we can't. And that will save you just a little bit of weight. If you're hand holding all the time, you may not necessarily need that tripod collar. But like all the Sony and Canon, etc., it does not come with an Arca Swiss plate. You have to attach one. For me, I use a quite a long Suray attachment plate that actually tightens with an Allen key. I find the Allen key is much better. If you just tighten these by hand, they just come loose. So if you get one that tightens by Allen key, it should stay quite secure. And the next ring we have is the manual focus ring. And fortunately with Nikon, you have electronic manual focus all the time. You don't actually have to push a button on the camera. So you can just turn this ring and it will pull focus or change focus for you, which is great. However, one other exciting thing about Nikon is this is actually customizable. So if you don't ever use manual focus and you wanna change this to say, um, exposure compensation or something else, you have the ability to do that in the menu, which is just fantastic. I think that's a great idea. And it's quite easy to move with my thumb if I need to. Now I will say though, and something I noticed straight away, is that if you take your tripod collar off or you put it into this position here and you hold it in your palm, when you turn the zoom ring, you accidentally turn the manual focus ring. And I noticed this immediately because the peaking was turned on in the body. What that means is you get it like this blue color overlaid in your viewfinder of what part is in focus. And this blue was coming up constantly. I was thinking, why is it doing that? And then I quickly realized that it was peaking and I was just accidentally hitting it every time I was moving around. So that's a bit of an issue because if you accidentally hit the manual focus ring while you're taking photos, it will override 
and could potentially lead to soft shots. You can of course turn this off completely if you want so this doesn't even do anything but I quite like having that ability to use manual focus so for me the solution was just to leave the tripod collar on in this position I can put my hand under and then I can change the zoom I'm much less likely to accidentally knock this manual focus ring. Um, next we actually have the big zoom ring and it is nice and big it feels great as I've mentioned and we just go in and out very very quickly. Next we have some lens function buttons which is nice to see and there's how many one two three four of them on this lens. Why do you need these lens function buttons on the lens? Well you can customize them to a whole different things but there's one customization which I absolutely love. Full credit to Nikon. I wish we had this on Canon. You can set and recall a focus distance using these buttons. Now on my 100 to 300 Canon review they have a similar setup but Nikon's way they've implemented it is a little bit easier. So all we need to do is say we're at a hide and we've got a branch or a perch set up and we want to remember the distance to that perch just in case. So let's say the camera gets onto the background and it gets stuck on the background and we want to pull it back quickly to that perch. So all we need to do with this is we can look through the viewfinder. I can simply push any of these lens function buttons or you can assign it to one or all and then it will remember that's distance, it'll remember that focus distance. And then all I've done is set up a button on the body to recall that distance. So now if I ever want to pull focus, I simply just hit this button on the front of the camera and immediately pulls it back into focus. And this is excellent. So you can see I've got a perch set up on my property where I get birds coming down. I've simply held down the lens function button to, and it, you'll see it pop up saying that it's remembered that distance. And then if I go to the background on purpose, I just hit the button on the camera and immediately it comes straight back to that perch. Fantastic Nikon, well done with that. I wish we had that on Canon. And I'm happy to see that it does come with the lens hood so you don't need to buy that separately. And it uses a 95 millimeter thread but overall what a fantastic lens, build quality is excellent. Very very happy. Okay so you can see a few other lenses here. I want to talk about the weight and size of this lens because it's quite important. Because this is a 600 millimeter lens with a max aperture of 6.3 that dictates the size. We can't escape that and as such it is quite a big lens and if we talk about the weight you got to be careful because these manufacturers are a little bit tricky. They often just release the weight of the lens without a tripod collar and without a hood. So I like to include the weight of the hood and the tripod collar because that's how I shoot. So the working weight of this lens with tripod and hood is around 2.2 kilos or about 5 pounds which actually makes it slightly lighter than the Sony. The Sony is about 200 grams um, heavier. However, it's obviously significantly heavier than the Canon 100 to 500 and it's also a lot heavier than the Nikon 100 to 400. But that's what you get for a 600 millimeter zoom. So it actually isn't too bad in terms of its weight. So I think the other thing we need to consider is the body as well. We obviously need to attach a body to this lens. I've currently got the Z9 which is a very heavy body. This combo is about 3.6 kilos or 8 pounds which makes it quite heavy. But I suspect many people will be using a much lighter body with this. Say the Z6, even the Z8, you're going to be around 3 kilos. So 3 kilos for me is definitely hand holdable. However, over time your arms will get a bit tired and if weight's an issue you may end up having to use a monopod or a tripod. So in terms of its actual length, it's around 315 millimeters long. So it's almost identical to the Sony in terms of its actual length um, and size. They're very, very similar. Now obviously it's a lot different to the Canon. <laughs> we can see the Canon is just a lot smaller. Here's an overview of the sizes when we look at the Nikon, the Sony, the Canon and of course the Olympus just to give you an idea of the size of the lens. All right so let's talk about the thing most of you are interested in and that's the image quality. For me what I'm mostly interested in is the final product. So what I'm going to do is share lots of images and then we'll do a few comparisons and do some pixel peeping. But I just want you to focus on the images that I was able to capture from this kit. Now it's worth mentioning I am using Nikon's flagship Z9 camera. I didn't have access to any of the more affordable bodies like the Z6 or the Z7 or any of the APS-C offerings. So we have to judge that based on this amazing camera that I have here. And also I need to mention this is a pre-production lens. This isn't the final version from Nikon so it may vary to the final release. Let's start with good light. What was I able to capture in good light with this combination? Well the first subject is my good friend that lives in my front yard is the resident male superb fairy wren. He's always good for a photo and he posed perfectly for me allowing me to get a burst of shots and as you can see as you would expect 
fantastic detail, it's sharp, he just looks fantastic. So another subject that's here in winter is the Scarlet Robin, and I've taken many wonderful shots of him. Again, he let me take some really good shots with his setup, all handheld. And again, this image is beautifully sharp, shows off that beautiful red chest. Again, these shots are exactly what I would expect from the setup, just great. And one shot I really enjoyed taking was I went to the wetlands with this kit and there was a purple swamp hen walking through the reeds and I was firing away and I just happened to get that one as it's peeking through the reeds looking at me. I love the eye contact in this. It's just one of those funny, unique sort of shots that just bring a smile to my face. And again, that was taken obviously in nice light. The closer you can get to the subject, the more detail you're gonna have. I was just simply driving down the road and there was a cockatoo feeding in a tree. I've wound down the window. I always have the camera next to me when I'm traveling in the car. I've pulled up the camera straight out the window, focused on this cockatoo, took a range of shots. And when we zoom into 100%, the detail in that bill is just fantastic. No issue when you're up close with good light, uh, the quality is excellent. Obviously, we don't always get to shoot in good light. And if you saw my previous video, I've had to deal with a bit of fog recently. I went to a lake and I photographed these uh, pelicans in the mist and the IQ isn't good at all because of the mist. However, you have to remember that composition is key and I was able to capture this image and we put it into black and white. And overall, I was very happy with the outcome of this. With a bit of processing, we're able to bring it up. And I think what this image shows is that sharpness isn't everything, it's composition. This image isn't really that sharp and it doesn't have that much detail. However, it's the composition that wins through and that's something I think we all need to remember and understand. But whilst I was at that location, the sun did come up and I managed to get this bird in flight shot of a pelican flying into the sun. It tracked the bird right into the sun and overall I just really appreciated this. Now I did use a little bit of magic AI to create the top part of the sun and maybe that's a conversation for another video, but overall I was happy with this shot as well. I also went into the forest when it was overcast and managed to get some shots of an eastern yellow robin. And if I'm being honest, this is one of my favorite shots I took with this kit. And here it is. I just love the feeling, I love the habitat. I like the big bright yellow of the bird and then the green grass and the ferns and the rock. It all comes together for me to make quite a nice shot. And I was surprised with the quality I got here, to be honest, it's performed very well. And what many of you do is just walk around and then photograph what you see. And I was walking back to the truck and I flushed an Eastern Rosella, which is one of our prettiest parrots here in Australia. And it was a fair way off, it's landed on a branch. It was between two branches. So I've just picked up the camera, obviously focused on the bird, rattled away, and we got this shot. It's just highlights what sort of shots you can expect to get wandering around in the bush with 600 millimeters on this full frame body. But I think it's important that I do reiterate that 600 millimeters on a full frame is probably not as much reach as you would expect. At times I still felt like 600 was a little bit short. For example, I photographed this female Scarlet Robin from around nine meters away. And as you can see in the full frame image, the subject is quite small. However, I am using a 45 megapixel body, which allows you to crop quite well. And after cropping, the image is, is fine. There's no drama whatsoever. However, if we want more reach, we can actually use Nikon's 1.4 converter. It is compatible with this. You get the full zoom range. It actually turns it into a 252 millimeter to 840 millimeter f9 lens so we do lose a stop of light when we use a converter however you do get that extra reach now there's probably a good debate about whether you should use one of these or just crop and camera and it's a hard one to answer to be fair for me personally i think this lens will perform best without a converter and because you're obviously a little bit faster and a little bit sharper however there's times when the subjects are just too small and you want that extra reach say for shorebirds or some ducks and different things if you want that extra reach you want the subject bigger in the frame and you don't want to crop heavily you can use the 1.4 converter so i did just that i attached the 1.4 converter and i took a lot of photos and i want to share with you the results i was able to achieve with the 1.4 converter. I was actually driving home, I'd finished my session and I've actually spotted a brown falcon in a dead tree and it was in a field so it was a little ways away but I like the frame, I like the sort of habitat of where it was. So I've gone all the way to 252 millimeters. I think I ended up shooting it as a portrait so I've shot the portrait to try and capture the tree and we can see in the background we've got ducks and we've got trees and we've got habitat and you can just make out that small brown falcon at the top of the tree. 
Now if I zoom, if we go to zoom to 840 millimeters, obviously that subject is now much, much bigger. And when we look at the two raw files side by side, you can just see the range that you get with this and it's just incredible. And I actually went for a different uh, focal range. I went for around 640 millimeters and here's the image. I did that because I just like the inclusion of those branches. I thought it just added context and just made the image a little bit more interesting. And again, that's just one of the benefits of these zoom lenses. You can just change your composition. You're not fixed like you are with a prime. So birds of prey were quite plentiful on my trip inland. The black shotted kite is one of my more favorite birds that I see. You'll often see it hovering in the sky looking for prey. And that's exactly what happened. I was driving, saw the bird. We got some footage handheld. This is footage handheld of the bird hovering. And then I've obviously taken a heap of shots. And this was with the converter. And I ended up converting this to black and white. And this was the final image I went for. I just felt this a little bit creative. I felt it lent itself to black and white with the black shoulder. Overall, loved that. And you can see it still was quite a bit of a crop, even at 840 millimeters. So another good test for these lenses is obviously at your local duck pond. I got up really early one morning and I drove there before the sun had come up. And I actually noticed that the moon was full. We had a full moon and it was pretty bright in the sky. And I thought, oh, why don't I just take a shot at 840 millimeters? So I actually did use a tripod for this. We lined up the moon, we focused on the moon and we got this shot. And when we zoom into 100%, I was pretty happy with the detail in those craters, to be honest. We can make them out. It looks good to me and shows the power of or 840 millimeters, just fantastic. Now, obviously I waited for the sun to come up and as the sun was coming up, we got a little bit of color on the water. We had this Eurasian coot swimming through the water. You can see that the autofocus is sticking to the eye as it glides through. And then we took this shot and I just like the feel of it. Now the IQ is not that great because the ISO is quite high. However, I just like the feel of it and overall very, very happy with this. And obviously as that moon was coming down, I noticed that it was at the top of the tree line. So I sort of positioned myself to try and get creative and have the moon in between some trees. And I sort of made a big error and this was my fault. I was actually using some landscape settings with a low shutter speed when I should have been using a high shutter speed because what happened, a, a raven has flown through the scene past the moon. I hit a burst, but there's just that motion blur because my shutter speed was too low. I still like the image. It just would have been a little bit better if that bird had been sharp. But uh, overall, I had a wonderful morning with the lens and the converter. Just worked excellent. I know many of you love parrots and we are fortunate to have so many here in Australia. I was driving home and I spotted a flock of red rump parrots feeding on the side of the road. Now these parrots are referred to as grass parrots because they're always feeding in the grass. And this flock was actually by a driveway to a lawn bowls facility. So they weren't as skittish as normal. I've laid down in the grass and I was able to get quite close. They were very relaxed. And I was actually having to shoot at 1 1 25th of a second because I was at f11 and the light was quite low. I think I was at ISO 6400. So some pretty tricky settings and fairly low light. However, I was still able to get some good shots. And I like this one because we've got the male sort of looking over its shoulder, looking at me. We have the red rump on the back, which identifies this bird. Overall cleaned up very, very well. Now, some of you are probably wondering, well, where are the mammals? Where are the bigger mammals? Unfortunately, I didn't have that much success with mammals. I did hit one kangaroo at the end of a session, which I actually got by surprise. I didn't even see it. I was starting to talk to the camera and then I spotted it out of the corner of my eye and it was backlit and we got this shot. I ended up quite liking this. It was just unique with the outline of the kangaroo backlit. Um, overall, that worked extremely well. And I know one member in particular likes a lot of my landscape shots. So I did take one landscape shot and that was from my front yard. I'm very fortunate to live on a hill that, and I get to witness the sun come up every day. And we managed to capture this shot of the sun as it was just coming out of the clouds, like the color, like the overall feel. And again, that was actually shot handheld at a pretty low shutter speed, I think 1 80th of a second. So as you can see from that array of photos that I was able to capture some absolutely stunning shots and overall, very, very pleased. However, I don't wanna sugarcoat these reviews. I wanna be quite honest and open. So it's important that I share my fails with you and my real world experience. Cause we all take soft shots. I take a lot of soft shots. So I just wanna share that with you. What I found in the field is that at 600 millimeters wide open, so 600, 6.3, the lens wasn't quite as sharp as I had hoped. I just found the images were just slightly off. They were just, just weren't as sharp as you would expect. And I wanted to check that so and do some comparison shots. So what I've done is I've set up Gary the Galah and I've taken some shots at 6.3 and I've taken some shots at f8. So when we say stop down, 
that's what we mean. So going from f6.3 to f8, we're actually narrowing the aperture, which often creates sharper images. And this is with all lenses, it's not just this lens. So that's exactly what I did. So when we compare 600 millimeters 6.3 with 600 millimeters f8, the difference is crazy. And we can see it here, especially on that ruler, you can see the sharpness different. f8 is just like a different lens to 6.3. So that's a bit of a bummer, to be honest. I had hoped it would be sharper at 6.3. Now, funnily enough, I went down to 500 millimeters and it is a lot sharper wide open at 500. So it only seems to be that focal range of 500 to 600 millimeters, which I was having some issues with. And I need to stress again, this is a pre-production model. It could only be this lens. So I would highly suggest you look at some other reviews and hear from some other people to see if they were having any issues at 600 millimeters wide open like I was. Now I am being a little bit picky, I guess, and I am pixel peeping a bit here. And I did still take some nice shots at 6.3. This pair of red rump parrots was taken at 6.3. Now I don't think this is a deal breaker. If you look at the shots I shared, majority were at f8 and I usually stop down anyway. And I suggest that if you have the light at least, that stopping down a little bit often improves your sharpness. And even with my massive prime here, that's max aperture is 5.6 with a converter and I shoot at 7.1 or f8 majority of the time. So it's only in low light situations where that extra bit of light would be helpful that you're going to have a slight issue or you could just zoom out to 500 millimeters. It appears to be quite sharp there at 6.3. Okay, so it's time to compare this lens to some other lenses to see how it fares. I think the best comparison is with other 600 millimeter lenses. Those being the Fuji 600, the Tamron, the Sigma, and of course the Sony. I only have the Sony on hand to test, so that's the only direct comparison that I can make. So all right, let's do a comparison of the Nikon at 600, the Sony at 600, both wide open at 6.3, and let's see what the results are. The first thing that I need to say, and it's a bit of a concern, and I already knew this, but this Sony is not a true 600 millimeter lens when we get close to the subject. If you're not aware, for whatever reason, certain lenses lose focal range the closer you get to the subject. And this is extremely apparent when we compare the images. Have a look. So we've got the Nikon on the left, we've got the Sony on the right, they're both at 600 millimeters taken from the exact same location, but you can see that the Nikon subject is significantly bigger than the Sony. Why is that? Well, it just has to do with the design of the lenses. This Nikon is actually closer to 600 than I think most zoom lenses. It's very, very good, which will please a lot of people. It does not appear to lose much focal length as we get close to the subject. And that is a massive advantage to this Nikon kit, especially when you're getting close over the Sony. It makes a big difference. However, when we zoom into 100% wide open, the Sony is actually quite a bit sharper. It is fairly sharp, wide open at 6.3. And if we have a look at the ruler, you can definitely see here that the Sony wins out in regards to sharpness, wide open. However, if we stop them both down to f8, this is when the Nikon actually probably now has the advantage because the subject's slightly bigger. They're almost comparable in regards to the sharpness. If we look at the ruler, the Nikon's like a different lens at f8. If you're shooting at f8, the Nikon definitely has the advantage, if you're shooting wide open, then the Sony has a slight advantage. And of course, this goes to 180, where this one goes to 200. It's not that big of a difference, but you can see on the screen that 180 is definitely slightly wider than 600, so it definitely has that advantage. All right, so what about the Canon, which is our 500 millimeter lens? Obviously, 500 is gonna be a lot um, smaller than 600, but what I thought I'd do is shoot both at 500 millimeters wide open. So I've got the Canon at 500, the Nikon at 500, and I was actually surprised again that the Nikon is actually bigger at 500. So obviously the Canon suffers a little bit from that lack of focal length as we get closer, not as bad as the Sony. However, the Nikon is superior in that regard. We've got a bigger subject. But again, when we zoom into 100%, the Canon wide open at 7.1 is significantly sharper than the Nikon. However, if we stop them down again, um, the Nikon is now very, very similar. This Canon is a lot more expensive. Remember, this is, I think, over $1,000 more expensive US than this one. So it's to be expected that this one is slightly sharper. However, at f8, again, the Nikon has a bit of an advantage. And I think if we go to 600 millimeters on the Nikon versus 500 on the Canon, this is when we see the benefit of that extra reach. The Nikon is quite a bit larger than the Canon. 
And when we zoom in, they're both 45 megapixels body. The Nikon is just much, much bigger. But the thing you need to remember with these different lenses is we can crop the Canon to 600 millimeters. However, we can't crop the Nikon to 100 millimeters, if that makes sense. We're at 180, we can't crop to 100. And the difference between 100 and 180 is enormous. And you can see on the screen here, we've got the Canon at 100 and the 180. So if you shoot a lot of wide shots, and it's obviously a lot lighter as well, then obviously the Canon has that advantage. However, if you wanted a lens like that, you could obviously opt for the Nikon 100 to 400, which is an extremely good lens, obviously a bit more expensive, doesn't have the 600 millimeters of range, but is an S-line lens with even better VR, so that's definitely an option for you. All right, so we obviously need to do a comparison with the converters. So we put a 1.4 on the Nikon, a 1.4 on the Sony. We're now at 840 millimeters on both lenses, and check it out, that Nikon is again significantly bigger than the Sony. The Sony is just losing reach as we get close to the subject. And when we zoom in to 100%, again, that subject's much bigger. Again, the Nikon's not that sharp wide open, even with the converter, as you would expect. The Sony is much sharper. However, again, if I stop down to f11, the Nikon is now very, very sharp. If we put a 1.4 on the Canon, we're now at 700 millimeters and 700 versus 840. Again, quite a big difference. And we'll just rinse and repeat this story. The Canon is sharper wide open and overall it's a sharper lens. However, we get a lot more reach with the Nikon. So after using all of these lenses, what's my overall thoughts? If you're shooting wide open, the Sony obviously has a slight advantage in terms of sharpness. However, if you stop the Nikon down, it is on par with the Sony, and of course you get more reach when you're getting close to the subject. So overall, extremely competitive and not a lot between them. So the next thing I wanna talk about, and this literally blew me away, is the image stabilization. That is the IBIS of the camera and the vibration reduction of the lens. When used in combination, I think you get five and a half stops but it is so good. The EVF is so steady. It's kind of magic, to be honest, with just how steady this viewfinder is for a lens that's this big and this long. Um, I'm just so impressed, to be honest. I wanna share the results with you and explain exactly why it's so good. But first, I just wanna share a couple of shots with you that I was able to take handheld at ridiculously low shutter speeds. The first one is this Jackie Winter on a perch. This was handheld at 840 millimeters have a guess at what the shutter speed was. Believe it or not, the shutter speed was 1 30th of a second. 1 30th of a second at 840 millimeters. Just incredible feat, to be honest, that you could even get a sharp shot. Sure, lots of them were soft. However, even the fact I even got a sharp image was impressive. Now, to make sure that wasn't a fluke, I actually photographed this female Scarlet Robin, and this was actually at 1 40th of a second, so slightly faster, but still extremely slow. And that image is sharp. Again, I was just very surprised. So how is it doing this? Well, the thing I immediately noticed when shooting handheld, and it's off-putting to be honest, is that I'm looking through the viewfinder, it's quite steady. As soon as I hit the shutter, the EVF recenters, like it moves. So every time you hit the shutter, it recenters, and it obviously does that to create the most stable image possible. But I found it quite off-putting because I've never really experienced that with any of the other brands, this viewfinder moving. And I feather the shutter because I'm a Canon user and I often hit the buffer. So if I'm feathering it, we've got the viewfinder constantly recentering itself. And you can see in this EVF footage, this is exactly what's happening when I'm hitting the shutter. And I found it quite off-putting, to be honest. However, I spoke to a few Nikon shooters and they said you get used to it. And uh, thankfully though, with Nikon, you can customize just about anything. As I mentioned, you can actually get into the VR quite easily, the settings, just by pushing the button on, the information button on the back of the camera. So if we have a look at the different VR modes, you've got normal, sports, and off. So if we go from normal to sports, it stops that recentering and it will behave like a lot of other viewfinders if, if you have an issue with that. And I'll be honest that I kind of prefer the sport because I'm just used to that. However, there's a big trade-off. If you go from normal to sport, your keeper rate at slow shutter speeds will drastically change. So what I decided to do was actually take a burst of shots in normal and a burst of shots in sport and see what the difference was. So I was shooting at, I think, 600 millimeters, and we were at 1 50th of a second, so pretty slow. My first burst was 93 shots, and unbelievably, 60 of those were sharp. So around 65% keeper rate at 1 50th of a second, and I shake quite a bit. 
that's very impressive. I then switched to sport. I took a burst of 130 shots and only 20 of them were sharp, or around 15%. So there was a massive drop. We went from 65% keepers to 15. So what that tells me is that you need to get used to that recentering if you want the best possible VR. Um, otherwise, your keeper rate will obviously reduce substantially. I think in good light, it wouldn't matter so much because VR isn't having as big of an impact. But at low shutter speeds, you ideally should really be using the normal VR because it just works so well. And I think what that tells me is you should have a lot of confidence shooting this handheld, especially in low light environments. So with those red rubber parrots, I was in a real low light situation. One 1 25th of a second uh, is very slow, but again, I shot that handheld and got lots of sharp images, which was surprising. So the other major benefit of such good VR is video. I know many of you don't shoot video, but those of you who do, you're going to be extremely happy. As a hybrid shooter, this Nikon is incredible. You can shoot video handheld, put a bit of image stabilization in post, and you're good to go. It really is that good. Now, I shake quite a bit, and even I have been able to get steady handheld footage. I did a quick comparison with the Sony. I've taken some video of Gary the Galar. I'll put them up side by side, and as you can see, no comparison. The Sony is just all over the place. It's like I'm drunk. IS of the Sony just can't compete with the Nikon at all. So again, that's one huge benefit of this Nikon system is just that very impressive VR IBIS combo. All right, that leads me on to the autofocus of the lens. And I'll start with the good. It is good and I got lots of bird and flight shots. You've seen a number of the shots I was able to take. The eye tracking of the Nikon's good. But if I'm being 100% honest with you, I struggled a little bit with the Nikon autofocus, but it is still very good. The ability to track a subject uh, through the sky is just incredible when you think of how far we've come from DSLRs. And here's a burst of shots of a great cormorant. It's flying towards me and I'm obviously just holding the camera. I think I was just holding 3D tracking on the subject. It's tracked it and tracked it and it started banking. And we've got a whole range of shots to choose from. We're shooting at 20 frames per second. So we're getting all these different wing positions and the final image is just fantastic. Obviously you can see in this footage here that I did struggle a couple of times where it's missed the corner and it's gone to the background. And look, that's not just Nikon. A lot of other brands have issues with backgrounds as well. It's just one of those things. I think overall, the amount of shots that I was able to get that were sharp, indicates to me or tells me that the autofocus of this lens is pretty good or is very good. But as you know, I like to be transparent. I like to be honest. If I was to reflect on all the images I took over the week, which is over 10,000 images, I think my keeper rate was a little bit lower than I had hoped for or anticipated or have experienced previously. Now, of course, that's largely my fault and I'm sure that keeper rate would improve as I use this system more. It was just my reality and I just want to be honest with you. One thing I haven't touched on is the minimum focus distance at 600 millimeters is 2.4 which is identical to the Sony. It means that you can get the subject quite big however it's nowhere near the magnification of say the Nikon 100 to 400 or the Canon 100 to 500. You of course can add the converter which will give you more magnification and unfortunately I didn't really photograph any insects or butterflies or anything because we're in the middle of winter. However, I did photograph this native plant and you can see the sorts of shots that you can get. You can get quite close. Now in regards to our depth of field, because we've got a 600 millimeters or 840 millimeters, that compresses the scene a lot. It sucks in that background and we can get quite a bit of background separation, especially if the bird is isolated. Now the fact we've got to shoot at f8 to get sharp images means that our depth of field will be a little bit wider than say 6.3, but it's not a big issue. And you saw in the shots that I've shared that I've got plenty of background separation. The depth of field is not an issue for me with this lens whatsoever. What are my final thoughts on this lens? If you're a Nikon shooter, and you want 600 millimeters of range at an affordable price that offers you extremely good quality, it's very hard to go past this lens. I think this is gonna be extremely popular, especially when we get APS-C bodies with tracking. It's just gonna be an amazing combo. It's gonna enable people to enjoy wildlife photography as I do and just get out there in the field and get creative and use that zoom range. I'm excited for you, to be honest. I'm very excited that people are gonna get this lens. I know people have been wanting and waiting for a 600 millimeter zoom on the Z mount. We've obviously wanted on the Canon mount as well, but you now have it on Nikon. And for that, I think we should be very grateful to Nikon and very happy that they have produced such a quality lens for their consumers. And I think the other good thing is just the value, $1,700. I know that's still a lot of money, but what you get for $1,700 
has a high quality lens that's going to enable you to take many wonderful shots. It's also important I mention the weaknesses and as I've already covered I was disappointed with the sharpness of this lens at 600mm 6.3. Again this is a pre-production model perhaps the final version will be different however we do need to stop this lens down to f8 at 600 to get the best sharpness which isn't a big issue but it's just something I wish it was sharper at 6.3. For those weaknesses are minor uh, I personally would love to have this lens if we had it for Canon I would be buying one um, overall I think it will be a great addition to your kit and you'll have many wonderful memories with it uh, I'd like to obviously thank Nikon Australia again for lending me this kit I'm very grateful to be in a position to use it it's brought a smile to my face I've had so much fun I've taken thousands of images and loads of them are going into my collection so a great time has been had with this lens if you've got any questions feel free to leave them in the comments if you have managed to get the lens let us know what your experience has been is yours sharp wide open at 600 6.3 I'd be curious to know um, if you want to join the channel and help me make these videos consider hitting that join button under the video for the price of less than a cup of coffee you can become a member and you get a cool little emoji next to your name and obviously you will be helping me to continue making this content give it a thumbs up if you enjoyed it subscribe if you want to see more of these videos until the next one take care happy birding we'll see you later